to how we commit to live our life for you, Lord. That, God, you've given us everything. You don't owe us anything. But, God, we are still in this place of wanting to glorify you with everything we have. Lord, to point everyone we come in contact with to you, Lord. Not at us, but to you. And we just thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Hey, good, good looking group tonight. Well, I'm excited about this Sunday because we have our youth led service. Yeah, so um, youth led service. And also, just as the youth are going back, they're starting their small groups tonight. So that's new. Uh, Wednesday nights we'll have small groups. For those of you who have been ready to help with landscaping, we are uh, we're looking at rain tomorrow and Saturday. So I know that Friday is a work day for many, but if you happen to be available, we are working at 8 o'clock Friday morning and going to try to get as much done as we can on Friday ahead of the rain. I don't know how soupy it's going to get from tomorrow, but once the stuff hits, once we get the stuff delivered tomorrow, we need to get in the ground. So it will happen Friday. So you won't need to call me and say, Pastor, uh, it rained a lot yesterday. Are we still going at it Friday morning? Yes. The answer is yes. We have to. Um, with $3,000 worth of trees, we don't want to sit them out there for the picking over the weekend, all right? So we can get them in the ground. But we're going to have help from uh, uh, Derek Jensen, who is a cousin to Janessa Thompson, and uh, he is a professional landscaper. He's coming to, to help us. We have a piece of equipment that's being dropped off tomorrow that will that make the digging faster. But if you have yard tools, shovels, rakes, if you kind of know what it takes to plant shrubs, trees, and all that, and you've got something, bring it, mark it so you know it's yours and bring that with you. And we will appreciate that. Jennifer and I are ec ecstatic about this because that is the last of the requirements for the city of the building project. The dirt you see out there piled, that topsoil is going over the RV sites and that is a requirement for us to cover that and then get grass growing there. So um, that will be the last of it and um, we will we'll be able to celebrate that we are finally for sure done. Um, you got some beautiful trees coming, uh, Japanese Yoshino cherries uh, that have a white, whitish pink bloom in the spring. And in the fall, their leaves have a little turn of color as well. And I chose uh, something other than maple leaves to blow off the property, um, something with smaller leaves that was very strategic uh, in that. So <clears throat> anyway, and we got some crepe myrtles, uh, some fountain grasses, uh, lots of fun, lots of fun stuff to plant. So... Uh, Come and help out. Um, the, the Easter, we will have the Easter planning meeting this uh, Sunday. This one, if you have been on the fence or you've been there and you're, you're kind of plugged in or maybe you haven't, this Sunday we are going to step out and start really looking at where everything's going to lay out and get our final plans together. We've got banners being made right now. That you're going to see a banner out at Centerton Lake uh, here soon, as soon as the banners arrive. You're going to see two on our property. You're going to start to see Facebook posts uh, and videos, uh, ads that are running, like we run ads uh, recently. Um, so we are, we're beginning that. So make sure you tell people. We did not come up with any handouts. We uh, put all of our ad money or our get the word out money towards Facebook ads and the banners and other means. We have, uh, well, it depends if they make us send back the eggs that they sent us that were filled with something different than we asked. But... Right now, we're sitting on about 4,000 eggs, uh, 3,000 filled with candy. If they let us keep the other 3,000 they mistakenly sent us, then those have little stickers and the rub-on tattoo things. Huh? What's that? If, they sit on, if you sit on them, they may hatch, especially if you're as heavy as me. They probably would all hatch if you sit on them. So anyway, it's going to be a good time. Uh, I have, uh, the church has purchased a or is purchasing a Nintendo Switch game system, which will be uh, uh, given away through a drawing. And everyone's going to be able to, even in a new song, you'll be able to enter to win. Uh, you'll just be texting to a form. Um, so, so you got a chance for a video game system, if that's your thing. We'll have a few other prizes, but it's going to be a good time. Be cooking hamburgers and hot dogs. But this Sunday, 4 o'clock, if you have not plugged in to the meetings, come. We, need, we do need some more volunteers. We are short on, on how many we need to pull this off. So hope you could be here. All right. Um, remind me, I'm a little foggy today. Did, was there an announcement or anything else? I, yeah. 
I'll also be praying about our Wednesday nights for the, the youth. We'll be meeting back there again, but we are looking at changing our format on Wednesday night for you here, still having it here, here at the church, but we may be changing something up in the future. Be praying about Wednesday nights. We're looking at uh, some options to get you engaged, uh, kind of in a small group setting yourself. So as we're looking to that, pray um, that God will lead us on that. All right, let's, let's uh, receive, uh, let's worship in our giving. Dear Jesus, thank you for today, God, and I pray that we have a great Wednesday night, God, to uh, learn from your word, God, and to fellowship, and I pray that you would bless the offering and the people that are here, Jesus, and I pray uh, that you'd bless the rest of the evening. Thank you, Jesus, in Jesus' name pray, amen. While they're receiving the offering, before I bring Ryan up, he is our preacher for tonight i just wanted to uh i haven't really taken time to say much from the pulpit about this but um waiting until it was announced and done but as you know we have been blessed with new beginnings children's home uh kids coming here and for the years that's been happening i have made a point to not say for the pulpit the new beginnings kids they are they're just our kids um i was very protective of them but as you know um there's been a shift in laws that prevented new beginnings from proceeding with the same type of ministry they've had. So all those kids have now been rehomed to, to other, either other facilities or other homes. And uh, so be praying for Vincent and Brittany. This is a hard transition for those house parents and the other house parents. It's going to leave a hole here at New Song. I mean, there's a, a bunch of the kids we see on Sunday mornings are those kids. Uh, but I will tell you, the good news is God is still going to be using New Beginnings Children's Homes. It's, there's going to be a transformation coming. I'm not going to say much about that because we're going to have a special service where I want Ken to really share that. But God is still going to use uh, the momentum of what's been going on there to the momentum there to continue to minister to to others. And so I'll let him bring that surprise out. But it's it's going to be good. And honestly, through the years, I wish New Song would have we would have I wish I would have made more of an effort to lead us in a stronger support to New Song or to New Beginnings than we have been. This new venture. Um, as I've been praying, I believe God is really going to be poising us to come alongside Ken and Shelly in new beginnings, even greater than ever before. And uh, this church body really be a part of what's going on there, more so than we have been. So um, pray for Ken and Shelly and their family as, as this transition's going on, and pray for those kids. Um, that was one of the inspirations for us uh, doing Memorial Bibles to Kids Camp uh, in in honor of our, our baby boy was because we're hoping that the, some of those kids will end up in a Arkansas Assembly God kids camp and that they'll be recipients of one of those Bibles. Ryan, come and share with us tonight. All right. Good evening. How you folks doing? Not near as nervous as I am, I presume. Going to hide this piece of trash. Okay. Well, I am very excited to share tonight. Um, it's always an honor to get to speak. It's also always really stressful for me just because I feel like I... Um, you know, there's a lot of weight when you're carrying the word of the Lord. You want to make sure you deliver it, you know, with... I'll hold it real close to my face so you don't have to have it as high. Um, there's, there's a lot of pressure. You're carrying the word of the Lord. Um, so, we're good? Can everybody hear me? Good deal. Well, um, first off, I just want to touch a little bit on what's going on with NSM, so that way you guys can get up to speed. Um, we've been working on planning a lot of things and doing, um, you know, seeing how we can further our ministry with the youth that pass through these doors over the course of, so this, I've been here for about 10 months now, and from the day that I started to now, I think Andrew tracked, we've had probably about 70 totally different kids pass through our doors. Uh, which is really awesome. That's about half of the regular 
attending congregation currently. So that's a huge blessing, and we don't take it lightly, and we are working on figuring out you know, more things that we can do, more ways that we can minister, more ways that we can coach them and disciple them. Uh, we actually have a, a kind of a mission statement that we've been working on and praying for. It is healed, equipped, and discipled. And those are our main focuses when working with the children. Um, so, for example, last Sunday, you might have seen a few of us hanging out after service while you were leaving. You might have seen some of the balloons that we were messing around with. And if you don't already pay attention to any of our Facebook or anything like that, you might not know. But we had our first outreach, which is awesome. Uh, we got to teach the kids how to evangelize. The entire, much, blah, 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 blah. the entire month of March has been focused on uh, outreach and evangelism, sharing your faith to those around you at school, at home, at church, everywhere you go. And so I had the opportunity to lead this outreach that I did when I was in Bible college. It's called Cast Your Cares. And basically what we did is we took about 30 or 40 balloons filled with helium. A bunch of crazy kids hopped up on Mountain Dew and Domino's Pizza, some Sharpies, and we loaded them up into our cars and drove to the downtown uh, square in Bentonville. And we basically just went to random strangers and we were like, hey man, you, you got a minute to do my social experiment? Uh, no. <laughs> there, there were some really funny responses, like, uh, I'm pretty sure one guy told the kids, nope, sorry, I've got some walking to do. And then he just kind of kept walking away, which was awkward for the kids, I'm sure. But we did get to pray for some really awesome people. Basically, the exercise was we would take the balloons, anybody who was willing to comply, um, to play along, where we would go to them and say, hey, I want you to think about something that you care about very deeply. It could be something positive or negative. It could be a person a thing. Um, it could be something that stresses you out, or it could be a person or a thing that you love very much. And so we actually got to see a lot of really great things. I, um, we had kind of a debrief when we got back, but I know for my group, I got to see some kids really step out in their faith, in their boldness, and pray for totally random strangers and to share the love of God. It was really awesome. Um, on one balloon, I saw somebody write something like finances. I seen the word cancer twice. Um, homelessness was something. So I just want you guys to know that this area isn't exempt from any type of bondage or sin or brokenness, and that we should be focusing on continuing to do that. And we're we as the youth leaders and and the the minister ministry team, we are focused on getting out there and getting more people into these church doors. So if you know of a kid who participated, I would implore you to encourage them and to challenge them. Ask them some hard questions and say, well, what did you learn? What was hard? What was fun? You know, so um, anyways, thanks for listening to that. I'm done. I'm just kidding. I'm totally joking. Um, anyways, so what, uh, oh, you know what? I didn't even say what they did with the balloons. Wow. They let them go. We told them to let them go, and then we got to share the gospel with them. We got to say, you know, in, in the book of Peter, it says to cast your cares on the Lord because he cares for you. And so we, we got to pray with people and say, you know, there are things like your finances that the Lord cares about, and he wants to carry that burden with you. Matthew 11, verse 28 says, Jesus is saying, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. And he's talking about how he wants to help you carry the burdens of your life. And so we got to pray for some really awesome people. Um, I'm pretty sure my group, we actually prayed for a dude, and he had a necklace that looked kind of like a symbol, which was super awesome to share the gospel to somebody like that. So anyways, moving on, moving forward. I'm really glad this uh, podium pulpit isn't too tall. I've preached at a few churches where it's like this big, and I'm Barely peeking over, so good choice. Okay, so with that being said, with the outreach that we did, um, there, there are a lot of times in my life, and, and I would imagine that there are for a lot of us, where you see something happen, and you kind of take a step back from that experience, and you go, wow, this is what it's all about. This is good. I like this. 
And I've had a few of those interactions in my life. And, and this Sunday, I, I really felt that. I felt like the Lord was trying to open my eyes more, open the eyes of my heart and to realize, this is why I do what I do. This is why. And there, there's a verse that um, came to mind. It's in the book of Galatians, chapter 6, verse 9. I'm reading from the NIV. Uh, it says, let us not become weary of doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. So that, that's in the NIV. And that was immediately laid on my heart. And that's kind of what I want to talk on tonight. Um, my sermon is a little more practical, a little bit more laid back. I might ask you guys some questions and expect something in return vocally in my direction. You can tease me or you can answer the question. Um, hopefully you answer the question. So, um, the there was one of those moments there where I just thought, this, this is why. This is why I need to keep going. This is why the Lord brought me here. And um, I was reminded why I do what I do. And that's my first question. So in this Christian life, in this walk with the Lord, um, why do we do what we do? Why is it that it's not just you come in, you fall to your knees, maybe you cry and you say it's a real sweet little prayer and then you walk out the door and you're good and done and you're changed forever. You don't ever have to come back. You don't ever have to socialize with any other Christians. That's not the case, is it? Not so much. So my question is, why do we do what we do? Why at New Song are we buying thousands upon thousands of Easter eggs filled with stickers and, you know, things like that. Why do we take the kids out from the youth room into the world to help them grow in their faith? Go ahead. Why? I'm going to take a drink while you think about it. Now they're going to talk back, which might be a bad thing, depending on who's in the crowd. I'm just, what was that? It's a marathon, not a sprint. Mm, that's good. And offensive to me, a manager at Sprint. Um, ha, 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 ha. Anyways, yeah, yeah, there, there are a lot of reasons. So first one, uh, because of obedience. Um, one of the bullet points that I have is because... That's what we've been commanded to do. Matthew chapter 28, verse 28, uh, not 28, verse 18, sorry. Um, Jesus is talking to the disciples one final time before ascending into heaven. Uh, and he, sa he says to all of his disciples, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the end of the age. Amen. Um, so yeah, obedience. The Lord asks us to do so. Does he have the, the right to ask us to do so? Absolutely. Yeah, actually, my, that's my second. The obedience is my second bullet point. My first bullet point was because of what he's done for us. John three sixteen, right? God loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him. <laughs> Everyone's like saying their own little translations across, <laughs> not perish, but have everlasting life. Right. Because of what's been done for us, because the extravagant love that we have experienced from Christ, we are encouraged and so built up from that, that we want to go out and we want to share the love with everybody around us, right? That's how it is for me. There, was, there are so many people in my life that are so pivotal in, in my walk. And we, if we were to realize that, those people who have done that for us, we should return the favor to those around us. This whole town be on fire. 
Not the bad kind, the kind for Jesus. <laughs> um, no, but yeah, because of what's been done for us, we have been loved so extravagantly, so we should love extravagantly, right? We should give just as Jesus gave, right? And this one is very, very important to me, even outside of the spiritual context. It's because of those who are around us. There are people in my life, I'm this June, I will have my eighth sibling born. So I'm 24, and there are eight other people who are younger than me and related to me, and depending on their age, looking up to me, some of them look down because they're normal and tall. But um, it's okay to laugh. It's okay to laugh. Um, <laughs> Got to get it out. Got to get those nervous giggles out. <laughs> There you go. Thanks, Lily. Um, Yeah, because of those around us. There are people around us who need the love of God that we've experienced firsthand, right? I bet there are people potentially in your own homes, maybe in your workplaces. I know for me, I got some crazy people that work under me in my store. They are. (laughs) But Jesus loves them. So do I. Um, But yeah, because of those who are around us, Like I was saying earlier, the extravagant love that we have experienced, we must lay it on to others, right? There are people around us who need my love, who need the love of Jesus. People who need to have that same encounter that I've experienced, that CJ has experienced. And just a little side testimony, if we can get personal, being a family here, it is... It is not just what happened this Sunday that made me think about that. You know, a couple months ago, little Nathan Ray gave his heart to Christ. That's why we do what we do, because of lives being changed and impacted and growth, right? There are some crazy kids, and I'm not going to say who, because you might throw tomatoes at me. Tyler, no, I'm just kidding. Um, There are some kids in our group who I have seen mature amazingly from last May to now. The um, revelations of the love of God that they've experienced and that they have learned, they are now learning to give it out. They're learning some really awesome things that most teenagers don't learn, you know, things like being slow to speak or sharing things, you know, being nice, uh, This is a funny little side, like, children's church example. But, like, I bought a bunch of pizza for the kids before we went out last Sunday. And Devin uh, Pearson had to go drop off his wife and come back. He got back, and there's no more pepperoni. And Jordan Neighbors gave her last piece of pepperoni to him. I know. I know. That's why we do it. That's why we do it. All right, bow your heads. (laughs) Um. So my second question is, what is the motivation, right? And, and a lot, I'm going to be honest, a lot of my answers kind of bleed over and kind of repeat themselves, but at least you'll remember what we talked about, right? Um, but what, it, what is our motivation? I'll go ahead and extend that to you guys again. Hmm? God's love, Absolutely. Yeah, there is a, there's like a, I don't even know where I heard it, but there's a phrase that I say probably weekly in in the youth group, and it is, when we die, there is nothing that we can bring with us to heaven except those whose hands we're holding on to, the people around us. You can't bring your money, you can't bring your 401k, can't bring your shiny new car or your rusty old truck. You, <laughs> you can only bring those around you, the people who you can impact and that you can spread the love of Jesus to. Another one of my bullet points was what I had just said, was to share the love that we've experienced. There is, if you go... That way, that way, and that way. Over by the Dollar General here in Centerton. Across the street, 
Walker Construction, there's a man who works in there named J.R. Morgan. And that guy is one of my dad's best friends. This is a man who I have known from birth and grew up with his daughter my whole life and grew up spending the night at their house, spent many Thanksgivings with them because I grew up with a single father. We didn't have like Thanksgiving family dinners in our own home. We would go with other people, very gracious of him. Um, That is a man that I have seen grow exponentially in his faith. A man who used to spend many of his nights off from work away from his wife and from his daughter over at the bar across town and had certain magazines that would hang out in his home away from other people to see. And a man who would argue with his wife all the time and and would they would spit in each other's face and that sort of thing. I saw them change and grow over the years. I saw his daughter Cheyenne is the one that brought him to church. Cheyenne and I would go and hop on whatever was the first church bus to drive past their house and go to whatever church it took us to. And we finally stuck at one. There's a full gospel church in Southwest City, Missouri. That's where my family still goes. And that is where J.R. Morgan is the youth pastor and the assistant pastor now. And that is a man that I've seen his marriage go from practically falling apart to stronger than ever. And this is a man who has impact, impacted my life amaz- like extravagantly. I keep using that word now. It's in my head, Pastor. Good job. Good job. Um, but it is, it is because of the love that I've experienced and the change that I've seen in those around me and people like my father and JR and other people that I've grown up with that I have firsthand seen the truth and the power of God's love. And that's our motivation. That's why we do what we do. That is the motivation to share the love of God to those around us. And then, finally, who do we do it for? Jesus? Mm Mm-hmm. We do it for the Lord. All of those around us. Like I said, I'm the older brother of a bunch of a bunch of people, <laughs> and they are all looking up to me. And I couldn't bear to be the stumbling block for the salvation of eight other people, ten other people, two dozen other people. There are so many people that I have come into contact with growing up and when I went to Bible college and when I moved and served at various other churches and even coming here now. I could not bear to be the one that spoiled someone's current or potential salvation because of my choices. That is why we cannot grow weary of doing good, because of the people who are around us. There are people all around every single one of us that are looking to you and waiting to see each of your moves. And I'm sure that Pastor and Ken and many other people in here can, I'm sure that all of you could testify to the fact that there are people who have come to you and said, I've been watching you and how you've handled this situation with your family. And I'm amazed. I'm humbled by it. And and I want you to pray for me. That's a blessing right there. And that's why we should not grow weary of doing good. That's why we should be fixated on God and his love for us. I just want to share a brief testimony. Woo. So earlier I had mentioned that growing up, uh, it was just me and my dad. My dad had full custody of me since I was a year old. Um, I saw my mom maybe three, four, five times a year for Mother's Day, my birthday, Christmas, maybe a weekend like a Saturday here and there. Uh, My mom, for those of you who have not heard a lot of my testimony, is somebody who has not made some of the best life decisions. And it is a miracle that I can stand here today and be the man that I am because of the stark contrast from 
the upbringing that I would have had under my mother versus the upbringing I did have under my father. And my mother is a woman who, uh, she moved here from California when she was about 14 to take care of her aunt who was sick. And coming here, there, were, there are a lot of influences in southwest Missouri and Mack County area of drugs and alcohol and that sort of thing, but especially drugs. And that is a stronghold that has had its hand on my mom's foot for many, many years. And growing up under my father who had did his best to teach me the right thing to do from a spiritual standpoint and just from a just being a good person standpoint. I had just known that someday I would get an awesome opportunity to share the share love with my mom. And you know, for a lot of my time I actually resented her. Whenever I moved to Tulsa for Bible college, felt like the Lord had started laying her and other family members on my heart. And so for the whole two years that I was there, I would pray for her every single morning. I would pray that she would experience the love of Jesus Christ. And to see someone who, a woman who has worked probably over a dozen years at the local gentleman's club across the state line, somebody who has had a multitude of DUIs and DWIs, somebody who has done all of the drugs. Um, That is something that you could very easily become discouraged by and to think, no, I give up. It's pointless. I mean, she hasn't changed. There's, There's nothing that has changed. I have prayed for her. I have told her I'm praying for her. I have gone to her. I have invited her to my church, I have done this, I have done that. I have begged and pleaded, cried myself to sleep many, many, many nights with my mom's name on my tongue. And to grow up and to move back home, that was right when it started to change. I moved back home, um, I had a job, I had a car. And so I would, when I turned, when I moved back home, I made Uh, like a pact with myself. I promised that I would try and spend more time with my family. My mom, I have two sisters and a brother. Robin, she now has a son. My little nephew, Landon, cutest little chunk you've ever seen. Looks like a sack of potatoes. And um, Kylie, she just turned 19. Or 20, my bad. And then Mason, he's actually been here on a Sunday morning or time or two. Um, 17, junior in high school, tempted by a lot of stupid stuff. So if you want to agree in prayer with me, I'd appreciate it because he's a teenage boy. Um, and so I, I just had made a, uh, I don't know what the word I'm looking for is, uh, I'm going to do this, huh? A promise, a commitment. Thank you. A commitment to continue to pray for my mom and to continue to try and minister to her and to love on her. About this September, I think, has been two years since she was involved in an accident with her fiancé that killed him. And it is, it was not her intent, it is not her, her, it was not on purpose, but it was just a very unfortunate accident um, that had rushed him to the hospital, and he didn't make it on the way. And that night, um, I got a text from Robin, the next oldest one under me, my sister, who said, Mom wants to see you tomorrow. And there's not too many times that I get a text like that. And I said, absolutely, I will be there as soon as I can. And so... I made it home, um, got up the next morning, and I rushed over to my sister's house, met my mom, heard the news, and that day, 
I heard my mom for the first time ask me to pray for her. And that sounds like just the smallest thing, but to me, that's like moving a mountain because of where she has come from to have the, the hurt and then to be humbled so much to want to be prayed for. That is like moving a mountain to me. And so I got to pray for her. And since then, not everything has been perfect. She still struggles. She has depression. She has anxiety. She has PTSD. But I've been able to pray for her, visit with her more. Um, she, uh, she said, I want to start reading the Bible more. I said, okay, cool. Um, well, uh, what kind of Bible did you get? And uh, <laughs> what did she say? She was like, oh, it's a really good one. It has the Old Testament and the New Testament. And I was like, good. <laughs> That's a good one, Mom. You got the right one. I'm very proud of you. Or I asked her what version it was. And she was like, that's new and old. I was like, uh, awesome. <laughs> and <laughs> um, there's still a lot of growth. But it was something like that that brought me closer to her. And I can, I am... certain that if I were to have given up along the way, if I were to have turned my head and gone my own way, that I would have not gotten to be a part of that. I would have not gotten to see that. And even since then, I've had other siblings who, you know, do certain things they're probably not supposed to. And, you know, they've asked me, hey, you know what? If I got a Bible, where should I start reading it? I'm really glad you asked, actually. Here, uh, tell me what you're going through, and I will, I will lead you on the narrow path to Jesus. Um, it's exciting. It really is. I just I want to encourage you guys, and I want to finish, finish up with this. I want, um, I, want you to, I want you to think about this. If when Jesus was on this earth, He taught many people and led many to him. (laughs) And he died on the cross for our sins. He was put in the grave, and he rose again on the third day, just as prophecy said. When he did, just before his ascension, he went to the disciples and had basically said, soon I'm going to send an advocate. And after this, you will do even greater works than me. You're going to do some amazing things that even I have not done. If in that moment they just were like, ah, Jesus, we've been doing good for like three years straight. I just want to go home and eat bread and wash my feet. I don't know. That that was a really bad analogy. But if they were to have just given up right there and been like, "Ah, I I think I'm set. I think I've done all the, I think I've done enough good. Good to go. Thanks. Deuces, Jesus. And left. We wouldn't have had the book of Acts. We might have. It might have just been other people. But um, what I'm getting at is there, you have no idea who is on the other side of your obedience. Whenever you listen to what the Lord is teaching you and speaking to your heart and you say, Yes, God, I will do that. I will give $1,800 to this pizza guy. I will commit to praying for my brother who is an atheist. I will, you can fill in the blank with something that I'm sure you know. I will commit to keeping New Beginnings Children's Home open. You have no idea what is on the other side of your obedience. And who is on the other side of that obedience? So I just want you guys to close your eyes, pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you would strengthen us, Lord, mount us up on wings like eagles, God. I pray that in this moment, you would speak so clearly to each and every single one of us, that you would encourage us, and that you would remind us of the love that you've given to us and where you have brought us, Lord. I'm so thankful that you saved me, God. I'm so thankful that you have saved us. And Lord, I just pray in this moment that you would be speaking to our hearts, 
that you would be strengthening us so we might go out and continue to spread your love and continue to spread your gospel, God. I pray that you would also set people on our heart that you want us to minister to, that you want us to testify to and to love on. We trust that you will, and we thank you that you are speaking to us in this moment. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, guys. I'm going to step off the stage now. The altars are, are opened. Thank you, Ryan. And uh, I got the opportunity to hear a testimony about his mom when Ryan first came to New Song. Really, actually, it was a night we invited him before he was moved here and to speak to youth and very powerful. And I appreciate his transparency and willing to share. Things are very tender to his heart, but encouraged by the, uh, by the things that have been going on with his mom. And, you know, so many of us, that's, that's the risk we run. Um, I said, that's not the risk. Let me transition. A risk we run as believers who maybe came from a great home, didn't have a lot of struggle, or we've just had enough time that we've had our own families now and everything's been going good and peachy. We come to church and we get excited about singing to Jesus and we get excited about being here together and this kind of fits our little niche in our life to give us a, a you know, church is our, is our religion. The problem with that is, is it ignores the fact that we have brothers and sisters who have family outside of this building that aren't in these services that deserve the same opportunity that we had as someone pursued us. Holy Spirit used someone to pursue us. And, uh, you know, I won't mention who it is, but tomorrow I get a chance to go have coffee with someone from a family member in this church who is not in church. And, and those folks uh, pray for this uh, member of their family and believe that God is going to do something through them. And, uh, and I'm excited for what God has opened the door. But, you know, it would be easy for me to say, well... I'm the pastor. Somebody else needs to do that. Um, I got to worry about landscaping and other stuff and all the leadership stuff that goes along with what I do. But, but you know what? What really makes my personal relationship with Jesus thrive is my personal time with him in conjunction with giving out of that to others and pursuing people, pursuing people. I look around here, and how, how many here, if you feel like, okay, how many have a wayward family member that's within close, like either cousin, grandma, whatever, kids, see, see all the hands, hold them up for a minute. These are people that are not in church right now, correct? Of those people, how many live within 100 miles of here? Keep, keep your hand up if they live within 100 miles of here. Look at this, look around. Do you realize that if we partnered with the people in this room right now and we helped them pursue their family members and strengthen that, they, they've heard it all from their family member and they might be gaining some ground and, and like you said, you sow and you plant and water. But what if a brother or sister in Christ, how much closer would you feel to your church body if someone in that church says, you know what, I love you, and I want to see your family, all of your family with us in heaven, so I'm going to help you. Can I take your family member to, to coffee? Can I take them to a meal out? Can I invite them? Some of us are like, that might be weird. How, why would I do, do that? Why would they? You know what? I heard someone tell me a story about their family member and then God wouldn't let me sleep that night. It wasn't on the radar for me, but all of a sudden it was on, it was on primary focus. The Holy Spirit just told me, he said, this is, this is your moment, this is, it's, it's you. And when you start to listen to God, and I'm not trying to preach another sermon on top of your sermon, thank you for giving us an early night too. <laughs> so if you do want to spend time on the altar, but I'm just going to say this and, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll, we'll have a double close, right? But, you know, I'm sitting there listening to Ryan, and I appreciate he brings He brings some comedy and things. I can be pretty serious all the time. I realize when I preach, there's probably very little things that will make you laugh, and laughter's good. But when he turned that moment and began to share from his heart about his mom, it, I, I just be open and transparent with you. I'm thinking, here is this young man that we have in our church who he believes God is going to lead him to the right girl one day and have his family. And he has all these life things going on and he chose to leave New Life Ranch, which, which when I went to stay there for a three-day retreat, I'm telling you, a sacrifice moving from what he had there. Now, he, I'm sure it's not as great when you're working sometimes because there's other things, but the beauty of the surroundings, 
to live at a retreat center and sow into people the love of Christ. And then Ryan left that because he heard the Lord say, come here and help with youth. And when he got here, he got a pastor who was worn out and tired of a building project. And, and uh, I know today we went to lunch, and I know he mentioned that we've had talks where he can tell I was getting weary and well-doing. And the youth team didn't always hear the most positive stuff from me. I mean, I, I'm like, guys, we got to, I'm just, I was just holding things together. It felt like, you know, we were getting sucker punched left and right trying to get in this building. But then you stop for a minute and you think, we've got someone here and we've got other stories that we're not even hearing tonight of people who come every week and they give in different ways. I look at Sister Frankie. She is helping us head up with the kids' ministry. Jen not getting a call last minute on Sunday morning, I can't fill my role, has been a huge blessing to our family. And we've taken that for granted. We haven't really thanked you, Frankie, that that is, that that is a huge blessing to us. But she stepped in a gap, something with all the physical trouble she's gone through and everything. She saw something, I can do this. Uh, and, uh, but she has family members that we could, we could reach out to. They don't know us, but then again, if our youth can go out to a city place and stop people who are busy walking and interrupt their walk, tell them about Jesus, then maybe we could just interrupt somebody's family situation just a minute and say, hey, look, your family member comes to my church. I love them. Because I love them, Jesus put you on my heart, and I would just love to, I'd love to just take and get to know you over a cup of coffee or something. You know, we have people come through the doors where God has blessed us that they may be believers, but they're searching for a church home, and they just come in the doors for that one time, and you have a moment where God has brought them to your doorstep. God has brought them. You did not have to spend any more gas, time, nothing. You're not buying them lunch that day unless you offer. They're here. They walked in the door. And how terrible it is it if we get so absorbed in ourselves that we come in and we sit down and we look at this as entertainment, like these are theater seats and our tithe and offering is a ticket price. And with that, you should get some, some choice in what you get entertained with, right? And this, listen, this, this, this time that we have together, what, what I want the Lord to shift this time to be is as equal as important it is to worship the Lord in song, as it is through the word, as it is to do in action in these altars and praying and ministering to other people. That's why we're shifting our services soon to where we don't really have an end time. You're going to have an hour service, which everyone who is super spiritual is going to say, you are cramping the Holy Spirit. I mean, what, next is it going to be 30-minute service? But we didn't do it to shorten the service to give everybody time so they can leave sooner. We did it because we're not giving us ourselves enough time to minister to each other. And so we're going to make sure that at the end of that hour, even with the second service coming at 11, that when we end that first service, there is no pressure. It is encouraged. Stay as long as you want. And if there are people in the altar when we start second service, they're in the altar starting second service. And this is what God's been putting in my heart. The church has to shift from what we have let church culture become, where we are just getting entertained all the way to heaven's gates. When the focus is on me, 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 and what I can get out of it, listen, your spirit begins to dry up. You get very disgruntled. Life loses its luster. Serving Jesus loses its luster. And then all of a sudden, you can't see the dying souls around you for the fact that the deafening sound of your own needs it becomes like white noise. Everybody knows it's hard to hear uh, unless you articulate very well in this building because we don't have all the sound panels. Go in the foyer with about 15 people after the service and start speaking at a normal volume and see if you can hear. And what I believe happens in the spiritual realm is we become speaking about things that, that cloud our minds and get our focus off of what God wants us to do. And pretty soon it's like that noise in there. Nobody can understand anything that's going on. And then you look at the empty seats in here and realize, why are they not here? Because they can't understand the purpose of being here. Why are these seats all empty? Because there are people who, if they've come in this door, they can't understand why would I come here if nobody has time for me. So you take that times a thousand or a million when you go outside the walls because if the church isn't reaching them out there, they're saying all they care about is coming together with themselves. They don't have time for me. So I am excited about what the youth did. I'm excited you know, we're praying for a couple things right now. We have more people in the senior age now in New Song than we ever have. If you feel, if you feel like a senior, say amen. Amen, all right? 
I didn't say in body or mind. I just said if you if you are a senior, and, and we need someone to lead that group. You know, we're praying for that. But but man, over the last few years, we prayed for certain things and they have happened. We prayed for certain people and for certain ministries to be filled. And so listen, evangelism is not something where we pray someone in to do it all for us. Evangelism is where we say we're going to do it. But what I've been telling my team is this. This is very important. I want you to hear me because we could get knocked on a lot for not getting out and doing more. But, but to me, until we are truly discipling the people we have indoors, what are you going to do with them when you get them here? And you need to ask yourself that hard question. I'm not, this isn't to make us down or a negative. I'm just saying, you want to evangelize this community? Does everybody want to evangelize this community? I do. I want to see thousands come to know the Lord. I've had a vision about thousands of people standing on this property. I want to see that. But my question is, if they came in the door right now, what would you do with them? Chris, as a discipleship, is his forte in what he's come here, evangelism. Chris, can he handle a thousand people coming in here? Can he handle a hundred? I can tell you, Chris may be more talented and more energy than I do, but I've tried to disciple more than three te- people at one time. I mean, I'm talking about discipleship where you can call me about any time when you're struggling. I'll be there. I'll do Bible study with you. I'll, I'll walk a journey. I'll be over there holding your hand while you're you know, crying, praying for your family. Come, do all that. So when you're really, they are a disciple. See, we get excited about that, but, but having a disciple is a task. It's good, it's a joy, but it's work. And in all reality, I have watched church after church after church, and you can talk the big talk and all the kinds of uh, spiritual jargon you want to, but I have not seen a church really be able to handle more and more people until each individual starts taking on a few. It can get top-heavy where you have all these leaders, that are, but they do it through a service. They do it through programs of the church, but that's not a community. Uh, what I want to see is when we are having people getting into each other's homes and studying together and reading the word and praying for each other and knowing where their kids go to school and knowing what they do for a living and being close enough to them to know when they miss a service, where are they at? Where are they at? I want to make sure that their spiritual life isn't slipping, right? All right, I'll preach another sermon that. See, if you have time, you'll take it when you're a preacher. All right, let's do this. We're going to pray, and um, we're going to pray. And if you want to spend time at the altars, you can. I'm going to ask if anybody wants to visit. Um, those that don't want to come pray at the altar, let's just, you know, um, cordially move to the foyer and let this be a place of prayer for anybody that wants to. Um, that way they aren't disturbed. Lord, we just thank you. Thank you for Ryan, Lord, and his testimony and what's happening in his family. Lord, we pray right now for his mother and his father. God, we pray right now, I don't know where she's at. I don't know even really where she lives. I just know that, like the Roman centurion, I know that I don't have to be there for you to do something right now in this moment. But God, I pray as a testimony to the power of the Holy Spirit and for your glory, and because Ryan has stepped out in faith to share, to increase our faith by her story, I pray right now that she senses something different than she has before, that right now, Lord, your presence becomes more real than she has felt ever before. That, God, she is drawn unto you and drawn unto a body of believers who can strengthen her and disciple her. And, God, I pray right now that when Ryan speaks to her, God, that his words will take on even more power and meaning because she has realized that when Ryan tells her we pray that she has sensed something has happened. God, we're not doing this for any hocus pocus or any kind of show of anything, Lord, but because I believe with all my heart that right now as we pray, Lord, that we are petitioning your throne and that you are uh, sending your angels, God. You are sending your, the people that, that follow you, Lord, that truly serve you, God, to be in her pathway, that she can't look to the li- left, to the right, forward, backwards, up or down, God. Everywhere she goes now, there will be a believer speaking the truth and love, showing her your love in Jesus' name. And we pray this for all the family members represented here who do not yet know you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I love you, and if you decide to spend time in prayer, please take all the time you want.